Good morning to everyone and welcome to the Midnet First Research Conference. My name is Marilis Jakobsen and first I would like to give the floor to Professor Raivo Vettik, who is the coordinator of the Mirnet project. Raivo, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello to everybody. I would like to welcome you on behalf of Tallinn University and the Mirnet project, which is hosting this uh, conference. Our project was uh, has started uh, one and a half years ago. It is financed by the EU Horizon 2020 uh, twinning uh, program. We have four uh, participants in the uh, framework, Tallinn University, Roskilde University, Sussex University and Tambere University. We are very lucky to have several leading scholars in the field included in our project, like uh, Russell, uh, Russell King. And the purpose of this project is to establish a center of migration and integration research at uh, Tallinn University and to make it a well-known center. So this conference is one step in, the, in, in our glorious uh, way. I'm very happy that we have so many participants. Uh, it is a very interesting program and I would like to wish a very good conference to everybody. The key person behind organizing this conference is Marilis Jakobson. I would like to thank Marilis and give floor back to Marilis. Thanks a lot. And uh, welcome once more on behalf of the Board of Peace. Um, when we began planning for this conference, uh, the world had just rapidly changed and we were all up against a great unknown. And unknown things can cause anxiety, but they also drive curiosity, as of all people, migration scholars should know. And thus, this conference theme was born. Uh, of course, COVID pandemic is not the only thing that has been causing turbulence for this field of research. The fields of migration and integration have been notably shaken by a string of events, be they conflicts in the Middle East or Latin America, which have resulted in migration crises, newly discovered anxieties over migration in host societies, inflamed in particular by a surge of the populist radical right, or also the anxieties of an immigrant in a country that has suddenly decided to change the rules for extending a residence permit. It gives us great pleasure that the topic resonated with so many of you and that we managed to compile such an international and interdisciplinary program. I am happy to welcome all of the anthropologists, political scientists, sociologists, legal scholars, geographers, psychologists, international relations scholars, and many, many more uh, from over more than 20 countries. Um, conferencing online was not our first choice, but still an opportunity to embrace. Uh, while nothing can replace the experience of meeting one another in person, we do hope that this conferencing platform will offer you not just an opportunity to present or listen to presentations without the time and cost of traveling, uh, but also to foster networking. So do not hesitate to reach out to others in the collective chats uh, on every stage event or also on every session uh, and also to one another individually. So when you choose people from the chat menu, you can either text or video chat with any of the participants. Um, there is also a special networking tool which offers a kind of a speed dating opportunity with other participants. And of course, feel free to have a look at the expo where you can learn more about the Mirnet project as well as some other projects which are uh, presented at this conference. So I really hope you will have an interesting and fruitful two days at the conference. Um, unfortunately, we had two cancellations in the conference program uh, and our thoughts uh, are also with those who don't, did not make it to the conference, either due to falling hill or simply because of a lockdown with toddlers, which doesn't sit well with work as a researcher. Um, but almost everybody made it and i'm extremely grateful for that so happy conferencing uh enjoy the keynote 
And if you have any questions, uh, then uh, do not hesitate to write into the uh, stage chat. So we will be compiling all of the questions there and hoping to ask them all away in the Q&A section. But now I will give floor to my good colleague from the Mirnet project, uh, Professor Russell King from the Sussex Center for, for Migration Research. And he will be introducing today's keynote speaker. Russell, the floor is yours. Okay, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Maria Luis and, uh, and Rivo for organizing this conference and uh, involving me in this, uh, in this initial role. Um, I can think of nobody better qualified to give us uh, uh, an overview um, of the topic than, uh, than Professor Louise Bryan. I give myself a little pat on the back because I think it was me who suggested that uh, she'd be invited as the initial uh, keynote, uh, and I think that was a great choice. Um, Louise is currently Senior Professor and Director, and I'm going to have to read this out because it's quite a long title, Director of the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Centre at the London Metropolitan University. Cool. Um, well, that she's just moved to. Prior to that, she was for some years uh, professor of sociology at the University of Sheffield. And then prior to uh, much of her earlier career was at the Middlesex University uh, in, in London. Um, Louise, as I'm sure many of us know, has uh, an established reputation for working actually across many fields of, uh, of migration on, on many types and, and, and groups uh, of migrants. Um, I recall particularly her earlier work on Irish migration, which uh, reflects her own uh, heritage. I think her first degree was from University College Cork. Um, more recently, she has established a, a, a tremendous body of work on Polish migration. Um, so I kind of associate her mainly with work on Irish and Polish migration, but uh, delving into her long, long list of publications, I also find that she worked um, on, uh, on Muslim migrants in a couple of papers and also on French highly skilled migrants uh, in the UK as well. So really a, a diverse group of, uh, of migrant types. Um, equally importantly, uh, she's pursued uh, and developed a number of really interesting and, and um, I would say innovative uh, thematic uh, issues in migration. I mean, much of her work reflect uh, uh, her interest in social and family networks. These are perhaps two key words which kind of shine through a lot of her earlier work. Um, so um, yes, she's worked on Irish nurses and high skilled migrants, uh, but also other migrant situations all reflecting this uh, kind of social network and family network uh, background. Um, but the two kind of key things which uh, has, uh, I think, have really kind of jumped out from her most recent publications. And here I'm referring to her paper in GEMS in, I think, 2018, and her most recent paper in the International Migration Review 2020. Are these, which actually I see very interestingly woven into the topic of her uh, of her keynote, the, the notion of differential embedding, which I think is, is, is highly interesting and original, and then this notion of unsettling events. Uh, and I think these two terms, which, which are, are, are kind of key to two of her most significant recent papers, uh, really speak very centrally to the theme of the entire conference, and I'm sure they will be brought out uh, in the keynote, which we are now about to hear. So further ado, I would like to thank Louise for agreeing to give this keynote and I pass the, the floor to, to her. Thank you. Thanks very much, Russell, for that um, very nice introduction. Um, and also, I'd really like to thank the conference organisers and particularly to um, Marlies and Marina, who've been so helpful in helping me with the all the technical side of things and having a, a bit of a pre-meeting with me the other day to sort out the technical stuff. I'm now going to try to um, open my PowerPoint uh, so that you can all see what I can see. Um, this worked really well the other day and now it's... Uh, not working quite so well. Share. Let's see if this works. Um, 
Uh, no, that's not working. Okay, let me try this again. The joys of live. Mm, I'm opening the app, but my PowerPoint is not opening. I can see my PowerPoint, but I'm guessing you can't see it. Oh, I can see it now. There it is. Perfect. Okay. Um, Marilise, can you please just tell me, can you see my PowerPoint okay? Oh, uh, nice. So go ahead. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So as Russell very kindly and very helpfully said there in the introduction, the title of my presentation is Disembedding or Re-Embedding, Exploring Migrants' Responses in Contexts of Unsettling Events. So as Russell said, I'm bringing together these different concepts to, into conversation to address the current situation. Now, as you will all be aware, during the last few years, geopolitical events have really challenged our thinking on migration. I think it's fair to say that until recently, there was often a somewhat celebratory tone regarding mobility, transnational living, and indeed this notion of liquid migration, especially in the context of the European Union and free movement. However, now with Brexit, but also particularly with the pandemic and the associated national lockdowns, they've really served to remind many European migrants what third country nationals have well understood, that borders matter, movement is heavily contingent, and the ability to engage in transnational relations may be constrained by external forces. So these are the, this is the kind of backdrop uh, to my talk this morning. So, as Russell said, I very much draw on a social network's lens in my research, but another feature of my research over the last decade or so has been longitudinal data collection, both synchronously and asynchronously, and I'll say more about that in a minute. And in this presentation, I want to highlight some of the key findings and also what we can learn about migrants' likely responses in very uncertain times. I've conceptualized migrants' differentiated embedding, and again, I'll explain more about that in a minute, to analyze dynamic relationality and attachments in particular places over time. My work examines how short-term, often quite temporary or quite transient migration plans may gradually become extended as migrants begin to form relationships and attachments in local places over time. Now, of course, as we're all aware, Brexit disrupts processes of embedding. From my participants across a range of different studies, Britain's departure from the EU revealed their actually somewhat incongruous position as relationally, socially, and indeed often economically embedding in London, and most of my research has been in London. But now, since Brexit, having very insecure immigration status in the country as a whole. For some, this meant complete disembedding and moving on elsewhere or going back to the country of origin. But for others, it now required a new form of re-embedding in Britain by for the first time, engaging with the immigration regime and securing their immigration status. Gauging the complex and varied impacts of Brexit on, on migration plans may offer some insights into how other unsettling events, for example, provoked by the coronavirus pandemic, may force some families to reconsider and indeed reorganize their transnational migration plans and in particular perhaps their transnational caring relationships, obligations and responsibilities. So this is just flagging up some of the ideas that I now want to go on and discuss in more detail in this talk. So I'd like to just begin by saying something about this concept of unsettling events, which as Russell said, uh, I developed in a paper with Magella Kilke, which has been published in 2020 in International Migration Review. And in that paper, we talk about unsettling events, which we define as transformations on the structural level 
that have implications on the individual level in ways that provoke re-evaluation of migration plans. So in other words, this is a large scale macro level transformation like, for instance, Brexit, but it could also be something like the great economic recession of 2008. And so this is something which is happening out there, kind of beyond the control of migrants, which then impacts on them at an individual and family level in ways that may cause them to change their migration projects. So that's what we mean by sort of structural level impacting on the individual level. And obviously, when we were writing that paper, we were very much focusing on the recession of 2008 and on Brexit. But now, of course, it seems like the pandemic could be yet another one of these unsettling events. And indeed, in a recent chapter that I'm currently developing with one of my Polish colleagues, Veronika Klok Novak, we are precisely talking about the pandemic as another potential unsettling event, which may change people's migration projects. And of course, what we've seen very much unfolding and intensifying in recent years, particularly against the backdrop of Brexit, but of course, we can trace it back to the so-called migration crisis of 2015 or earlier, is this notion of rebordering or bordering. And this is a concept which has very much been developed by Nira Yuval Davis. But I want to just quickly mention how this is being played out uh, in the current environment. So recent events have very much shone a light on borders and the salience of borders. Since the Brexit referendum in 2016, the mechanisms to close British borders against different types of people have really intensified. And of course, the pandemic has made that even more pertinent. And I was just listening to the news this morning while having my breakfast at a very early time here in the UK, uh, where they were talking about now closing the border to travellers from Brazil because there's a new strain of the virus uh, being found in Brazil. So we see this very targeted approach to containing movement and closing borders. And often very, very quickly, almost overnight, a border can be closed. And this is something which is not new to the pandemic. And in fact, if you look at previous uh, pandemics, we see similar strategies have been enacted. And in a very nice paper from 2008 by Harper and Rahman, which was published in the journal International Migration, they're talking about the SARS pandemic in the early 2000s. And in the SARS pandemic, we actually see many of the same strategies being enacted. And they talk about the ways in which when a disease becomes deterritorialized, in other words, when a disease is seen as being a problem globally because it's crossing borders in a rapid and almost uncontrolled way, then one of the policy responses to that is the re-territorialization of people. So in other words, if the disease is being carried by people, the way you stop the travel of the disease is by stopping the travel of people. And I think that's quite a nice expression from Harper and Rahman, how the deterritorialization of disease can lead to a re-territorialization of people. And I would like to make just one observation on the side here, if I may. And I think one of the words that's continually being used to talk about the coronavirus is that it is unprecedented. But in fact, we as social scientists, we often have a very poor understanding of history. And in fact, if you look at history, there have been many, many pandemics which have been quite similar to coronavirus. And if we don't learn lessons from previous pandemics, then we are, of course, condemned to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. And even the SARS pandemic, um, you can see that some countries learned a lot of lessons from the SARS pandemic, while other countries perhaps the UK learned no lessons at all from the SARS pandemic and so treats every pandemic as if, you know, it's the first and it's unprecedented. But speaking of closing borders, one of the most dramatic examples of that that we witnessed here in the UK was in the days just before Christmas in December 2020, when the French authorities very rapidly closed the border uh, between Dover and Calais, which is a very, very busy sea route. And they closed that almost with no notice or warning at all because of the new strain of the virus that was found in the UK.
And this caused absolute pandemonium, not least for the 9,000 or so lorry drivers who were stuck in Dover in the days just before Christmas, which was a nightmare situation for them, as you can well imagine being stuck in a lorry in winter for days and days on end. But it also led to panic shopping in many uh, supermarkets in the southeast of England, where people thought the disruption of flow of food supplies was going to be affected by the closure of the ports. And this is a photograph. I hope you can see it. It's a little bit grainy. So we've got a photograph here on the left of this huge pileup of 9000 lorries when the border was very suddenly closed. And if we contrast that with a kind of picture which we've all become very familiar with over the last 10 months or so, uh, a completely deserted airport where travel has pretty much stopped. And I think what these events have shown us is that we cannot take movement for granted and we really have to look at the contingency and the constraints that control movement and mobility. And as I mentioned a moment ago, this very much goes hand in glove with a wider project which predates all of these events, and that is the hostile environment towards migrants, the ways in which migrants have been excluded or uh, vilified and demonised uh, predates Brexit. And we can even look, for example, at another important unsettling event which occurred in the UK, the Windrush scandal. And I'll just very briefly for our international guests say a little bit about the Windrush scandal. This arose from, again, a sort of historical anomaly whereby in the period, in the immediate period after the Second World War in the 1950s and 60s, very large numbers of migrants arrived in Britain from the Caribbean. At that time, they were British subjects, so they didn't need um, visas, they didn't need work permits, they came to Britain without any immigration barriers. In fact, they were invited to come to fill gaps in the labour market. But over the years, as emigration regulations changed, uh, they suddenly found themselves in a position where they didn't have a visa or they didn't have a work permit, which was kind of ironic because they'd been living in Britain for 50 years. And then suddenly they found themselves being declared overstayers or illegal migrants. And they were threatened with deportation. And in fact, some of them were deported, often back to countries in the Caribbean that they may not have been in for 40 or 50 years. So really quite a shocking scandal, which led to the resignation of the Home Secretary um, in the British Parliament. But this again was a very, um, it was a wake up call. And there are now commentators who are warning that we may begin to see another Windrush scandal, this time of EU migrants in the UK who have not regularised their status and may suddenly find themselves being declared illegal migrants. And I would just like to add at this juncture, my own personal opinion is that in the main, that will not be recently arrived uh, migrants from Eastern and Central Europe, <clears throat> because I think many of those people are very aware of the need to regularise their status. It may be some. I think in the main, the people who are most at risk are in fact the people who are a bit like those Jamaicans who've lived in Britain for 50 years. I know quite a lot of Italians, for example, who came to the UK as children who've lived here for 50 years, and they may well be the ones who may have difficulty regularising their status or who may simply not think that they need to. And that's why we may now have a new Windrush scandal with EU migrants in the UK now that Brexit has happened and we have left the European Union. And what uh, Nira Yuval Davis and her colleagues have been talking about with this notion of rebordering is the way in which we have all now become border guards. She talks about how landlords, employers, schools, hospitals are expected to check people's immigration status to um, ascertain if they are entitled to be in the country, if they are entitled to work, if they're entitled to rent property. And a landlord who doesn't check somebody's immigration status can actually be fined quite heavily for renting that property to somebody who has insecure immigration status. So over the years, we've witnessed this increasing hostility towards migrants in Britain and indeed in many countries across the EU. And as Verdi and McGeever have written in a very important paper from 2018, this long predates Brexit. And in fact, we really need to look at 
the period well before that, including accession in 2004, uh, which triggered this increasing hostility towards migrants. And of course, all of that has been further exacerbated by the pandemic, where we've seen many examples of hostility, particularly to migrants from China, or indeed anybody who looks vaguely like they might be from China, has been subject to increased uh, kind of suspicion associated with the spread of the virus. So what we see here um, is the way in which the the discourses are shifting. And I think this is really important that we take full cognizance of that. For a long time, I think there was a very much an emphasis in migration studies on the ways in which freedom of movement had facilitated new kinds of migration projects. And several people have written about that. And a whole load of new concepts were coined to describe the new sort of migration projects associated with freedom of movement. We had things like temporariness, circularity, pendulum mobility, um, intentional unpredictability, liquidity, et cetera, et cetera. The list is endless. Now, I think one of the risks with these concepts is that they tended to really emphasize the novelty and the newness of these kinds of um, forms of mobility. And again, I would go back to a point I made earlier about the ahistoricism of a lot of social science research. I think we, I'm a sociologist, I think a lot of sociologists are guilty of being ahistorical. Because actually, if you look back in history, you can see many examples of similar kinds of um, migratory projects. As Russell mentioned at the outset, and thank you, Russell, you absolutely set up many of the points that I now want to make. Uh, I've done a lot of research with Irish migrants and indeed Irish migrants going back to the 1950s or the 1960s had temporary plans. They had a kind of a circularity in their migration expectations. But of course, that didn't always work out in reality. And so this is about um, understanding kind of historical precedents as well. And one of the things I would say about Irish migrants is almost every Irish migrant I have ever interviewed has said to me, I only came here for a year. So this kind of very short term plan. And of course, many of them ended up staying for the rest of their lives. So again, I think we need to bring some historical insights into understanding some of the concepts that are currently being seen as completely new and novel. But I think because there was so much emphasis on the ability to move, freedom of movement. But there's another side to that directorate. It isn't just freedom of movement. It's also freedom to settle. And I think there's been too much focus on the movement and perhaps not enough focus on the settling. Because, of course, as an EU citizen, you could have had, well, particularly in Britain, but of course this continues now for the remaining 27 countries, uh, is that you can't just, you don't just have the freedom to move, but you also have the freedom to stay in that country, to extend your stay, to work, to set up your life in that destination society. And so while we've been focusing in the literature a lot on mobility, this ability to come and go, we have perhaps underestimated the ways in which people are embedding, the ways in which even recently arrived migrants have this possibility to extend their stay. And so therefore may actually be thinking more about staying rather than always thinking about mobility. So this is where my work has tended to focus. And so to capture that, John Mulholland and I came up with this notion of embedding because we felt that the established concept associated with the work of Mark Granovator, embeddedness, is a bit too static. It suggests an achieved state. Now I am embedded. Full stop. The end. But of course, life isn't like that. What we liked about the notion of embedding as a verb is that it suggests an ongoing process, a process that never ends. But of course, that is not to suggest that everybody embeds in the same way or that everybody has the same opportunity to embed. And that's why this concept of differentiated embedding is an attempt to capture the, the different kinds of strategies, different opportunities, but also the different obstacles that people may encounter in, in their embedding experiences. 
And so one of the other things that we thought was very useful about the notion of embedding is that it has built into it an opposite, disembedding. So if you think about embedding as a process, it's also possible to go into reverse. An unsettling event can trigger a process of disembedding. And that's why I think that, that this is quite a useful family of concepts, embedding, differentiated embedding, disembedding, which really helps us to capture the complexity, contingency, and indeed dynamism through the life course. Now, when we're talking about dynamism over time, it's really important to think about the complexity of temporality. And there's been quite a lot of interest in recent years in how we as migration researchers can take account of time and change over time. And Russell, uh, along with other colleagues, has also been writing about the complexity of time in migration studies. Now, in my own work, I've drawn on the influence of Glenn Elder. I think Glenn Elder's life course theory is very useful because what I particularly like about Glenn Elder's work is that he brings together different concepts of time. He talks about biographical time, where I am in my lifetime in terms of um, age, but also career stage, family life stage. So on the personal biographical level but also how that is situated in a broader historical time. So it's not just that I am a mother, I am a migrant, but it's also I am a mother, I am a migrant in the 21st century in Britain at a particular moment in time, historical time. So it's bringing the biographical and the historical into conversation. And so we could argue that being a young single migrant being a middle-aged parent with uh, school-aged children, or being an older person with care needs. This is your biographical time. But this will be played out differently uh, because of the wider historical time in terms of an economic recession, a pandemic, or indeed Brexit. So it's how those, co those come into conversation. And of course, as we know, it's very hard to research change over time. How do you capture dynamism? How do you pin down something which is very fluid? One of the ways that I've tried to do that in my research is through qualitative longitudinal research. This involves following the same participants over time, repeatedly interviewing the same participants to try to find out how they're feeling, what they're doing, what's happening at different junctures in their biographical time and also in historical time. This is particularly useful when we understand how migration projects can be changed by the economic recession, by Brexit, or indeed by the pandemic, by interviewing people at those particular junctures. But of course, that is very difficult because that involves money um, and other kinds of resources. It involves our own time and it involves the long-term commitment of the participants. So it can be really challenging to do longitudinal qualitative research, particularly over a very extended period of time. So how do you follow up participants beyond a particular project? So if you have a two, a three or a four year project, you may interview people three or four times during that project. But when that project is finished, when the funding has run out, how do you then find out a year, two years, five years later, what happened to those participants? Now, one of the ways that I have had to do that in the absence of ongoing research funding for those projects is through using asynchronous methods. Now, asynchronous methods, particularly using email, have been around for a long time. They're not as novel as perhaps one might suppose. They've been used for, for well over 10, in some cases, nearly 20 years. People have been using email as a mode of research. Now, I don't mean an email survey. I mean actually asking interview questions via email, and then people type their responses to you via email, and then you can type follow-up questions, and they type further responses. So this is what I have used. Now, there's a body of research on using this kind of asynchronous method uh, as a whole study for a whole project. For me, I should emphasize these are people I have already met and interviewed face to face, sometimes several times. And then I use email to follow them up years later. So it's a kind of a mixed method that I apply. 
So I now want to say how I've used that in two projects to um, explore people's responses to Brexit. Now, as of course, I'm sure you're all aware, there have been a plethora of articles about Brexit, including by Russell and his colleagues, but by other many esteemed researchers as well. There's a there's almost now a whole sort of subsection of migration research about Brexit. So what I've tried to do in my research is to adopt this longitudinal um, perspective so that I'm not just writing about how people are responding to Brexit now, but I'm also comparing that with their responses when I first interviewed them, their migration plans when I first interviewed them up to 10 years ago. So that really enables me to see how Brexit is shifting the plans that they had previously presented to me in earlier research projects. And in a recent paper, um, which will be coming out in the journal Population, Space and Place in the next few weeks, um, it's already been accepted. Uh, this is a paper in which we actually compare participants talking about Brexit and Windrush. So in that research, uh, we interviewed uh, people from the Caribbean, Irish and Polish, and we're bringing together their experiences of both Windrush scandal and Brexit. So that paper is coming out soon. If anybody is interested, um, I'd be happy to send them the reference. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a growing concern that as yet tens of thousands of EU citizens in the UK have not yet secured their immigration status. So I just want to very quickly now in the remaining 10 minutes or so talk you through this um, research that I did. So um, as Russell mentioned, I have done research with Poles and French uh, and the I've done several projects with Polish migrants, but in particular, I want to mention a study I did in 2014 in which I interviewed 20 Polish migrants. And then in 2016, I followed them up. So that was just two years later. I followed them up using email, asynchronous method, and I got 14 very detailed responses of people from that initial 2014 study. And then the French study was conducted in 2010-11, and we did actually follow them up in 2012-13. So that was already longitudinal face-to-face -face interviews. That was with my colleague, John Mulholland. And then in 2018, we had this idea to follow them up and see how they were responding to Brexit. And we again emailed them. We got a lot of bounce backs. So it was it was not easy to contact all of them. Uh, but in the end, we got 18 responses, some of them pages and pages long. Uh, so that's what I'm now going to talk about. So across both the Polish and the French responses, there was a very strong shared theme of shock. People just did not expect the Brexit result. It came as a real surprise to people. And I would say part of the reason for that is that they lived in London and London, of course, voted to remain in the EU by quite a large majority. In fact, the borough where I live in Lambeth in South London voted 79% to remain in the EU. So you can imagine if you live in that milieu, if you live in that environment, you will think, oh, well, this, this referendum is never going to pass because everybody I know is going to vote to remain in the EU. So then when the overall result came through, people were really shocked. So Eva from Poland, who had lived in London for over a decade, said, on the day after the vote, I actually couldn't stop crying. The loss of belonging to Europe, the aggressiveness of the out campaign, it was all too much, too sad. Agnieszka, also from Poland, described her son's sense of rejection. She said, even my nine-year-old son, who was born in the UK, doesn't feel welcome in the UK now. He wants to go back to Poland. However, she was reluctant to make such a hasty decision and she adopted this wait and see strategy. And in fact, many of the respondents said they were going to wait and see. Similarly, amongst the French data, a very similar pattern. Yule from France had lived in the UK for over a decade. Sorry, he'd lived in London for over a decade. And he said, it certainly changed my feelings. For the first time, I feel like a not welcome foreigner after the Brexit result. One French participant had already left. Noemi wrote, it made me want to flee the country, which I did 11 months after the referendum. 
And interestingly, in Noemi's case, she did not flee back to France. She actually got a job in Holland. So she was again able to utilise her mobility rights to go and live and work in another EU member state. Despite the shock, the disappointment, the surprise, most of the people who responded to us on both studies said they wanted to stay. They did not want to leave. And this was often because of family reasons. This was about their networks. It was about relationality. So Martina from Poland said she planned to stay for her children because they consider themselves more British than Polish. Even though both she and her husband were Polish, she said, we never thought we needed citizenship, but it will probably be more difficult to get it now, not to say more expensive. We're not sure if we would like British citizenship, but it's hard to say what we will do if we are pushed to the wall. So again, another slightly sort of wait and see strategy where people are saying, yes, we realise now we will have to do something about our immigration status, uh, but let's wait and see. We're not looking forward to that. We'll only do it if we really, really need it. Others wanted to stay because of their career, but they realised they needed now to secure their status. So Colette from France, who had a very senior position in um, a financial institution in the city of London, she said, we are apparently safe if we've been here for five years. However, if it's the route I need to take, in other words, to regularise her immigration status, then so be it. I want and hope to be able to stay in London. But in terms of embedding, what I found fascinating was that for many of the participants, the Brexit referendum in a way was almost a wake up call to them because it suddenly made them realise that actually they had been embedding in London. It was almost like this gradual process that had been going on in the background. They may not even have been consciously planning it, but it had sort of somehow happened over time. And then it's like anything, you really only miss something when it's threatened with being taken away from you. So Karina from Poland said, after moving here, probably as many migrants, I never really thought about England or any place as forever. It was always as long as it works. But now it's become more fluid, if a bit trapped. I feel cheated, investing so much of my life to train and set up my life here, to find myself in a situation in which I really feel unwanted in this country, even more unwanted than we usually were. Now, I think this is a very nice quote from Karina because she's talking about that sort of contradictory feeling. She feels unwanted. She feels insecure in Britain, but she also feels trapped. So both simultaneously trapped and insecure, it's, it's a very difficult position to be in. And this, again, is about that differentiated embedding. On one level, she feels really um, unconnected, disconnected. So a lack of embedding in Britain. But on the other hand, because of her career, she feels almost stuck, almost trapped because her career is very much in Britain. And she also talks about that personal embedding because she's married to a British man. And then she talks about something which I think is really interesting for migration scholars, that sort of transportability of cultural capital, where she's talking about her career won't travel very easily, but neither will her husband's. She says, neither his nor my profession travel easily. So if we want to stay in our professions, we would both, which we both love and trained so many years to be in them, we are very severely restricted in where we can live. And at the moment, it does not seem that we can move without changing our profession or a severe drop in income. Now, in a previous paper that I wrote with Umut Earl back in 2019, we talked about the transportability of cultural capital. To what extent can people pack up their qualifications, their experience, their accreditation, their sort of professional identity in a suitcase and carry it across borders? And what we see here is that some professions do not travel easily. Some professions require language qualifications or they require accreditation from professional associations. Uh, and it just may be really hard to pack up and take your profession to another country. And I would like to just mention an observation here. I think one of the most portable careers 
is an academic because we as academics can often work almost anywhere, language permitting. And so we have to be very careful that we don't assume because we as academic researchers can travel around borders very easily that other professions can do the same. In fact, some professions find it almost impossible to move because of accreditation requirements within different countries. And Karina was one of those careers and her husband's business also couldn't translate very easily to other countries. So she really felt stuck. Now, because of this, um, because people suddenly recognised that actually their lives were in Britain, which came as a bit of a surprise to some people, uh, they then had to do something about it. Just doing nothing was no longer an option. They now needed to take action. And I really liked the, the exchange I had with Mateusz from Poland. I had first interviewed Mateusz in 2014. And at that point, he'd made a really lovely observation. He'd talked about becoming a Londoner, which really gelled with my embedding idea. He said, I am becoming a Londoner. And it was very much a process of identifying with London, developing an attachment with London, really feeling a very strong emotional connection with London. And he actually made the point that I don't think I live in Britain. I think I live in London. And that became a huge problem for people with Brexit, because as I mentioned earlier, London did not vote for Brexit, but the rest of Britain in the main did. And so it was a wake up call to migrants who had lived in London, sometimes for years, treating London as a global city, treating London almost as an entity in itself. And then suddenly with Brexit realising, no, London is not an entity in itself. London is part of a nation state and that nation state is now imposing a decision on us. And we have we are going to be affected by that. We can no longer pretend we live in a country called London. So when I went back, I was really intrigued to see how Mateusz uh, was getting on, given that he had this very London focus. And he also talked about this sense of shock, this sense of disappointment, but also the fact that he now needed to secure his legal status. Again, Irene from France, another very interesting example. When I interviewed her in 2010, 2011, she was very clearly embedding in London. She'd lived in London for a long time. She had a career as a lawyer. She was married to an Englishman. And then when we went back and spoke to her again asynchronously, she said, my life is in the UK. I have been here for nearly 30 years. I have lived here more than in France. We have three bilingual children who go to very British schools. My husband is British. We are not moving anywhere. However, given all of that, her first application for citizenship was actually rejected, which came as a massive shock to her. And then she talked about applying for leave to remain, which was so difficult to obtain with a mountain of bureaucracy, with lots of tears and arguments at home. It took its toll in many ways, and it was difficult until the last hurdle when I applied for my British passport. I had to send a whole family tree going back to both sets of grandparents with date and place of marriage, birth, death, a very difficult process. And I have to say on a personal note, as Russell mentioned earlier, I am Irish. I am actually an Irish citizen. I have an Irish passport. I don't have a British passport either. And neither did my son. My son only had an Irish passport. So I applied for a British passport for him, even though he was born here. And I applied for the passport for him. And I also had to do this family tree of going back to his parents, his grandparents, their place of birth, their date of birth. So I totally empathised with Irene because I had had to do the very same thing uh, for my son. And, and it was a really, really laborious and very difficult process. So just to bring this to a conclusion. I think it's necessary to really understand change over time in the context of unsettling events. If you interview a migrant once and they tell you something like, I'm only staying here for a year, plans change, situations change. And so if we really need to think about how to capture that longitudinal dynamism, that change over time. And one of the ways in which I've sought to do that is using longitudinal methods. And I find this framework of embedding really helpful because it captures that quite fluid, but also dynamic process of belonging and identification as, as multi-layered 
and complex, as emotional, as personal, but also as practical uh, in terms of career, jobs, relationships, uh, immigration status. So I really find it quite a useful concept. And of course, one of the big advantages of embedding is that you can also have this very sensible verb of disembedding. Uh, and also by examining the kinds of diverse strategies that people are putting in place. As the data has shown, some people were adopting a wait and see strategy. Other people were adamant that they were going to stay and they now had to take action to secure their status. But nonetheless, it often could undermine their sense of embedding, making them feel unwanted and unwelcome, but also perhaps a bit trapped because of the time they had invested in their lives in London. Whoops, sorry. Um, and so what we see is that people often felt this dilemma that Brexit made them realise how much they had actually invested in London, uh, but at the same time shocked them with this sense of now uncertainty um, this unsettling of their migration project. And in many cases, it sort of sparked the need to now begin to, in, to do a sort of a, a legal process which was completely alien to them and they had never had to engage with before. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention and um, I look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot, Louise. Um, one feature that online conferencing is definitely missing is clapping. Instead of giving you an applause. Thank you for a really inspiring talk. Um, we have some questions already coming in uh, in the chat. So others also feel free to add your questions and really sorry that you can't ask them in your own voice. So I will try to do the best to be your mouthpiece. Uh, but first, Louise, um, I have a, a, a bit of a personal curiosity. So it, it's striking as how um, migrants kind of uh, had this confrontation with the nation state, uh, which was having a referendum, and they are obviously embedded in this kind of translocal context. But um, I was wondering, have you ever had any uh, interviews uh, who have been conforming with this nation state understanding of identity and integration and so on? People who come to the country and think that now in five years time, you know, I'm going to be a UK citizen or, or whatever, who are, you know, deliberately strategizing to become a, a citizen of a nation state. That's a very interesting question. And Overall, I would say amongst the um, predominantly European migrants that I've interviewed, no, I hadn't come across that before Brexit because it just wasn't an issue for people. However, in the recent study that we did where we were interviewing Caribbean, Irish and Polish, older people, so these were in the main very elderly people in their 80s and 90s, uh, they were post-war migrants. And one of the things that really struck us was we asked all of them about their um, identity. How would you define yourself? And all of the Irish said, we are Irish. Now, again, these are people who'd lived in Britain sometimes for 70 years. We're Irish. The Polish, we're Polish. The Caribbeans, we are British, which was emphatic. We are British. And I think that was about immigration status in the main. I mean, it was also about that colonial legacy but it was about claiming the right to be British, claiming the right to be part of a nation state, which neither the Irish nor the Polish really felt a strong imperative to do. But the these black migrants who had come to Britain in a context of heightened hostility and racism, particularly in the 50s and 60s, really asserted this very strong sense of belonging to this nation state and having a right to be part of it. So that that really struck me. And I think that's um, a very insightful observation about how uh, immigration regimes can influence how people narrate their sense of belonging in a nation state. And you're quite right to make that distinction between a, a kind of a translocal sense of belonging in London and uh, belonging to a nation state. Thanks a lot. Russell.
Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I would like to thank Louise for really a, a, a brilliant talk. I mean, so much of it resonated a little bit with my own uh, research as well. So I found myself kind of mentally putting little ticks against <laughs> things that you said, which I absolutely agreed with. Um, so that was fantastic. Um, I have just two, two brief questions, if I may, um, um, before we open it to a wider audience. Um, Firstly, um, a little bit provocative, if I may be, be so. I mean, to, to what extent is your um, phraseology um, uh, embed, embedding and disembedding? How does it different? How is that different from the term that we're kind of much more familiar with, which is integration and, if you like, disintegration? I mean, the, the, the term disintegration has also been been used and you know there's another parallel in the sense that integration is both a state of being integrated and also a process I mean very much a process uh, in fact which can go in, in 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 either direction so that's my first question the second question is about um, citizenship and I wonder whether you can kind of just enlighten us about whether the choice of taking British citizenship is dependent on whether the home country allows dual citizens, because it seems to me that taking British citizenship, if you have to forsake your own citizenship, is a kind of all or nothing, uh, and, you know, quite a psychological uh, leap, let's say, whereas if you can remain uh, with two passports and two citizenships, then it's less of a less of a deal. Thanks. Yeah, I'll take the second question first. Uh, yes, that's absolutely right. Um, and what was really fascinating, particularly in this more recent study we've done with the older Polish migrants, is that many of them had had to give up their Polish passports when they applied for British citizenship back in the sort of um, in the communist era. Many of them had rena had um, renounced their Polish citizenship during the communist era. Uh, and now with Brexit, we have this kind of uh, anomalous position where we have older Polish migrants who are British citizens applying for a Polish passport, which was something that they had. It, it was emotionally so difficult for them to give up their Polish passport in the past under the communist regime. And now they found themselves reapplying and reapplying for their children and their grandchildren. So we can see how that ability to have two passports can open up opportunities for people, which enables them to secure their right to stay in Britain. But at the same time, not only gives them the right to go back to the country of origin, but also to maintain all the other EU freedom of movement rights. So, for example, I mentioned Noemi, who, because she's a French citizen, can now still go and work in, in Holland. Whereas, of course, for a British citizen, that would be much more difficult. So it's it's that ability to maintain a foot in both camps and enjoy all of the opportunities that that entails. So, yes, it, it, for, for those people that I was interviewing, the ability to have a dual citizenship was clearly something uh, very important. In terms of integration and disintegration, I mean, first of all, I think disintegration is a horrible word because we know what disintegrate means. It means to disintegrate. So it's a horrible word and I don't think it works. Sorry, but <laughs> I think, you know, semantically in English, the word disintegrate means to kind of fall apart. So but also I think one of the reasons why I avoid the word integration is because it is so politically loaded. And it, it just comes with the whole kind of policy agenda and it's very normative as well. And I think some people find that the normativity of integration quite off-putting, that you should integrate. And it also suggests, again, that process of, of something which you have to do, which is, is being prescribed. Whereas for me, embedding is a much softer concept which takes more account of the emotional and the relational dimension. So it is a matter of preference, but I just find that it's it's more neutral. And I also think disembedding makes more sense because if you think about embedding from a horticultural perspective, putting down roots, disembedding, taking those roots out, unlike disintegrating, which means you know falling apart. So <laughs> Semantically, I think it works better. 
I yes, I agree. I mean that that's in a sense the answer that I I, I sort of expected. But just just one tiny tiny quick fo follow up. I think the word disintegrate works if you hyphenate it, so it's not disintegrate falling apart. It's dis hyphen integrate in exactly the same way that you hyphen re embedding and dis embedding. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll stop here and and give the floor to many other people who I'm sure are dying to ask questions. Okay, thanks, thanks Marie. Russell. Thank you. Thanks. Um, there are some conceptual questions uh, posted in the chat. So Victoria Finn is wondering. Uh, you answered already the part of the question about uh, integration, but also the concept of resocialization, which is uh, fairly common, especially in political sociology, when uh, people's um, uh, kind of political socialization into the uh, country is being discussed. So um, uh, what are your thoughts on resocialization versus embedding uh, concepts? And then there is a second question about uh, if embedding is ongoing, when and how does re-embedding occur? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I'll start with that latter question. So I think that Embedding is ongoing. Differentiated embedding is, is, is an important step there because what differentiating embedding does is if you imagine a plant with multiple roots and what I'm talking about with differentiated embedding is that some of those roots may be much deeper. So you may have very deep roots, you may be very deeply embedding in your professional regime, for example, or in your local neighborhood, if your children are going to the local school, if you have friends who live in a local neighborhood, then those roots may be quite secure, quite deep. So that embedding is quite deep. But then you may have quite shallow embedding at the level of the nation state. For example, you may not feel part of Britain, but you may very much feel part of your local neighborhood. So that's what I mean by differentiated. So re-embedding may mean that on some of those levels, particularly, for example, the very shallow embedding at the level of the nation state, if you feel now a complete disembedding there because, for example, Brexit has happened, for example, you feel you no longer have that toehold, you no longer have that sort of foothold at the nation state level, then that will require re-embedding in the sense of now securing that status. So that's where I would see it's about embedding as an ongoing process on multiple levels. Differentiatedly, differentiatedly, is that a word? Different, differentially, sorry, differentially experienced um, in terms of different depths with different levels of, of kind of security. And then um, disembedding can occur on those different levels. It doesn't have to occur on all levels simultaneously. And then re-embedding is where you actually have to kind of do something to increase that level of security, uh, which might be applying to secure your status, for example. So I hope that's kind of answered that question. Resocialization, I'm sorry, but that word makes me think of China. And it makes me think of those terrible kind of resocialization centers that they they run for um, Muslims in China. So I I really don't like that word resocialization. So I think again it's a bit like integration. It's become a very politically loaded concept. So it's not one that I would use. Okay, thank you. Um, another uh, concept suggestion. So Linda Lapina uh, asks about. Kind of parallels between uh, embedding and belonging mm -hmm. and uh, maybe you could elaborate on the differences between uh, those two concepts perhaps belonging is more subjective she thinks and not necessarily tied to uh, the informant's estimation of their access to the labor market etc whereas embedding might be more objective is, is this the case well belonging i would say is part of embedding. So we have been defining embedding as involving um, identification, belonging, attachments, relationality, but also through the labour market. Um, so it's, I would say, in belonging is a core aspect 
of embedding, but we feel that embedding has some additional dimensions. But it is certainly, I would say, embedding as a sort of concept is closer to belonging than it is to integration. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how we would think about it, because embedding does have quite a subjective dimension as well. But I think it enables us to look at it in a, a slightly broader dimension than just belonging. Right. And one uh, short question about the concept of uprooting by Eisenstadt. So do you see any um, kind of parallels there as well? Yes, I mean, obviously, uh, there's a strong horticultural kind of uh, theme running through this with my embedding of all these different roots. Um, uprooting is in Irish poetry. When I was a child in school in Ireland, we, we had to learn this poem in the Irish language, um, which was called Stutta. And that is that means uprooting. And it was about um, an internal migrant who moved from <clears throat> the west of Ireland, which was a Gaeltacht area where Irish was the main language spoken, and then moving to Dublin and feeling that Dublin was quite alien to him from his very rural, uh, very Gaelic uh, environment in the west of Ireland. And he uses this poem of uprooting to, to explain how he felt about being because he had to move for work. And even though it was an internal migration experience, it, it I think resonates a lot with um, what international migrants might feel. And in my own work, I have noticed that that migrants talk a lot about roots, about their roots, about uprooting, about putting down roots. So there's definitely a theme there. Um, but I still, for me, I think embedding in encapsulates what I want to say about that and how I understand that. But I can see that you could also think about it in terms of an uprooting, rerouting. One of the ways in which we use differentiated embedding is, again, if I can go back to the multiple roots. Um, I never thought I'd be talking about horticulture this morning. So this is very strange uh, way, direction in which this conversation has gone. Uh, but it's the differentiated embedding, because if you're just uprooted, it suggests that you pull up the whole thing. There's no roots now. They're all gone. But of course, um, we know through the transnational lens that migrants are always maintaining multiple routes in different places, um, in different depths, some quite deep, some quite shallow. And that's why I think differentiated embedding takes account of that, whereas uprooting can suggest a complete disconnection, which I feel is, is perhaps um, oversimplifying. And even with the Irish poet, I think he still had quite strong roots back in his home country. Absolutely. OK, let's uh, switch on to more uh, methodological questions from conceptual ones. And Garby Schmidt is asking about uh, how to bring kind of historical awareness into research. So what kind of strategies in terms of methodology would uh, uh, would you recommend or what could develop this uh, awareness further? I think this is a really important point. It's something I feel quite strongly about that sociologists and I think especially sociologists who study migration um, do need to take more account of that historical dimension. I mean, at the most obvious level, I think it's if you're reading, uh, sorry, if you're about to research um, any kind of migration route, that you don't just look at the current context, but you also read some of the previous work that's been done. So, for example, um, when looking at um, the feminization of migration, for example, there was a, a huge kind of explosion of research in the 1990s and the early 2000s on the feminization of migration. And there was almost this kind of implied assumption that prior to that, um, all migrants had been men or the vast majority of migrants had been men and that women had only migrated in a sort of part of family units. But in fact, those of us who've done historical research, oral history research, we know that women have been migrating since forever and that a lot of the kinds of experiences that were now being discussed in relation to the feminization of migration were not new experiences. Women migrants had had very similar experiences in the past. Um, and for example, migration from Ireland has always been heavily female. More women have always migrated from Ireland than men. Uh, 
almost consistently throughout history with just a few blips along um, along the time frame. So we can learn lessons from history. And I think we have to, because even as I've said with the SARS pandemic, if we don't learn lessons from history, we are always going to repeat the same mistakes. So I think it behoves all of us to take cognizance of history. Absolutely. Um, now, Laura and Almina have posed some questions about uh, the results that you presented. So you, you showed the uh, kind of commonalities between your Polish and French participants. Uh, but uh, uh, Laura is wondering if there were also some differences between the two groups, uh, between the old versus the new EU nationals. Almina is also curious about whether the opportunities they might have back at home have kind of an effect on uh, on their perceptions of, of Brexit? Yes, I mean, although much of my research in some ways has been done through an ethnic lens, I have to hold my hand up and admit that if you just look at the titles of my papers, Irish migrants, Polish migrants, French migrants. Um, but what I've tried to avoid is is kind of looking, is, is to then analyse them through that ethnic lens. So I've I have written a couple of papers where I've brought the participants together into one reanalysis. And I'm currently writing a book where I'm bringing all of my back catalogue of research together uh, from all the different studies I've done. I try to avoid saying, well, this is what Irish migrants do and this is what Polish migrants do and this is what Muslim migrants do because I'm much more interested in looking at themes that run across like gender or family uh, relationships or labor market experiences. And sometimes you do have to acknowledge that there are important differences. So for example, when I was doing the research with the migrants from the Caribbean, you know, that sort of absolutely explicit and overt racism that they encountered, you have to acknowledge there's a specificity in the experiences of some migrants uh, that makes them different in, in that respect from others. But then in the main, what I found is that there are th similarities that run across. So I don't want to continually uh, sort of reinforce those sort of national stereotypes. And in addition to that, I should say that with the French study, we were specifically looking not just at French migrants in the UK, but at highly skilled migrants working in the financial sector. So most of those were senior professionals working in banks. So that was a very particular group. And I don't then want to generalize about all French migrants. So I appreciate I'm oversimplifying by calling them French migrants, because in fact, what they were was highly skilled migrants working in London's financial sector who happened to be from France. So in that respect, they had very particular career trajectories and career expectations. And so for many of them, the next move would probably not be back to France. It might be to New York or Singapore or some other big financial hub. That's how they would have seen, or maybe to Switzerland if they wanted to stay in Europe. Whereas for many of the Polish people, they had very, very varied uh, careers. Some of them were also senior professionals, but some of them were working at much lower levels in the economy. So it's difficult to generalize because of the differentiation within each group. OK, uh, but still, I would probe a bit further on this. Would you say that, um, of course, it's, it's um, difficult to talk about ethnic determinism, but uh, what are your thoughts on kind of extrapolating on qualitative research about structural factors behind, you know, embedding or uh, embeddedness in the uh, in these uh, translocal contexts. Um, so, yeah, uh, there, this I think was what uh, Almina's question was about, you know, background context in their uh, home countries. And I see that Farid also has kind of a linking question. So he he's asking about uh, people uh, who uh, moved during the free movement and those uh, kind of post uh, or, or before that? And uh, does it also affect the maintenance of their familial and social ties? I think the latter question can, of course, be also answered kind of uh, incorporate uh, over, you know, the different uh, countries of origin. Yeah. 
Okay, so if you're pushing me to do some kind of a of a, of a, a national comparison rather than perhaps no, an ethnic no. comparison, but no, but I think I mean it's important to say, well, are there any particular differences? And, and yes, there there was a, one significant difference that I think is worth mentioning, and that is that the French in the UK anyway are relatively invisible. Uh, in fact, our study that we did was one of the very first studies. I think um, Adrian Favelle had done uh, quite a small study on on French, uh, but in the main, they were not well researched, whereas Polish migrants are perhaps the most over researched group in the UK. It's just phenomenal how much research has been done on Polish migrants. And that's about visibility versus invisibility. Now, of course, numbers matter because there are a million Polish migrants in the UK and there's about maybe 150,000, 200,000 French. So, it, it, you know, there's a difference of scale. But having said that, visibility really matters. So that the French up until Brexit really felt invisible. They were not being talked about in the tabloid newspapers. They were not kind of being um, scapegoated and stereotyped. They were almost being ignored, actually. They were under the radar. And so what Brexit did was really put them on the radar, them and all the other EU migrants, in a way they had never experienced before. So that is important. Whereas for the Poles, particularly since 2004, they had been absolutely in the spotlight. All of the focus, both in terms of research, but also in terms of political discourse, anti-immigration hostility, it was all targeted on the Poles to the extent that almost any Eastern European or Central European migrant in the UK was called Polish, even if they were Hungarian or Czech, it didn't matter, they were all Polish. So it was very highly visible. So that is a big difference between the French and the Polish, I would say, which is significant in terms of then how Brexit really hit them. It was such a shock to the French it, to, to be stigmatised in a way they'd never been before. So I think that is, thank you for pushing me, because I think that is an important difference. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, so then just the other question from Farid, you said, was was about those who had migrated before freedom of movement, was it? In yes. terms of the implications for their uh, transnational family practices, for example. Yeah. So um, amongst the Polish study, we had some people who had migrated before 2004 and they did remember what it was like crossing borders, having to justify where are you going? Why are you going there? Many of them had sort of signed up for English classes, English colleges that they then never actually went to, but it was just a way of trying to get into the country. And so they were they remembered what that was like, whereas, of course, the French didn't because um, England joined the e Britain joined the EU in 1973. So none of the French participants remembered what it was like to come to Britain before um, they had been all part of the EU. So that would have been quite a novel experience for them. But in the study that we've just recently completed on older migrants, so these are the people in their 80s and 90s, they did talk about what it was like crossing borders, <clears throat> particularly the Polish who had come in the post-war period, who simply could not go back to Poland because of the Iron Curtain and because they'd had to renounce their Polish passports, they were not allowed to go back to Poland or they didn't feel safe to go back to Poland. So for many of them, there had been decades when there had, had been no um, transnational connections or they had lost touch with relatives in Poland. And only sort of after things had changed significantly, they began to rekindle those. So I think, again, it's important to remember that not everybody is engaged in this kind of back and forth transnational mobility. And as we well know from third country nationals, as we well know from refugees, these experiences um, are probably the majority of experiences are like that. And we continually focus on EU freedom of movement. It perhaps gives us a very skewed account of the, the wider migration experience in terms of the opportunities for transnational family practices. And this is going to become an issue now for EU citizens in the UK in terms of care arrangements, for example, with elderly relatives, this question about whether you can bring in what we used to call in Britain the, um, the flying Polish grannies, that to bring these Polish grannies to do childcare or then to bring them to receive care 
if that's still going to be possible. Um, so it is going to change now. And we may see that these family practices are going to come in more to line with what third country nationals have always had to negotiate. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I see uh, Martin Schkaprans uh, has a question uh, to do with the concept of unsettling events. So he is asking, does this concept apply to structural changes as a push factor for migration? Uh, then how do you conceptualize biographical turning points as a push factor? So I think that uh, here he is uh, conceptualizing unsettling events as a push factor, uh, which, yeah, the first question would probably be, can they be a push factor as well, not just an interfering factor? And then also about the biographical um, timeline and, and turning points. Could they be push factors? Yes. So obviously we've been focusing on unsettling events in the destination society. But of course, some of those are global events like the economic recession was obviously global and the pandemic is obviously global as well. It is, of course, the case that an unsettling event in the home country can trigger migration as well. So people sort of fleeing war or fleeing an economic recession. And I did a piece of research on Irish highly qualified migrants who were coming to Britain immediately after the global recession. So around 2008, 2009. And so for them, their the whole narrative was that these were young people who had grown up during the Celtic Tiger. I don't know if you've heard of the Celtic Tiger. You might be too young to remember the Celtic Tiger. But it was a big thing in its day when the Irish economy was absolutely booming, the fastest growing economy in Europe. And it was called the Celtic Tiger as opposed to the kind of Asian Tiger economies. And it was fascinating interviewing young people who'd grown up in the Celtic Tiger because they grew up with an expectation of a certain level of economic security in Irish society that they did not expect they would ever have to emigrate. Unlike my generation who grew up in Ireland in the 80s and 90s, where we fully expected to have to emigrate. So these young people were then um, really shocked, absolutely shocked to their core by the global recession and the rapid collapse of the Irish economy, where unemployment was, was enormous. And this hit them very hard that they now found themselves having to emigrate, which they never thought they would have to do. And it was really significant for another reason as well. And that is because they had thought that all the people who'd left in the past, you know, those kind of previous generations of Irish who had to emigrate, people like me, that we were sort of poor us, you know, poor us, poor them. They had a tough time. They had to leave. But we, the Celtic Tiger generation, we're lucky. We don't have to emigrate. And then when they did have to emigrate, it challenged their very core sense of themselves. And they were suddenly like us, like my generation. Oh, no, now we're like them. We have to emigrate as well. So it was that how that unsettling event. And it's really interesting. Thank you for this question, because I hadn't applied unsettling events to that previous paper and that previous body of research with that generation from 2008-9. Uh, but now that I'm talking about it, of course, it's a very clear example of an unsettling event in the home country triggering outward migration in very unexpected and unanticipated ways. So, yes, that's a clear example of a push factor. Um, in terms of that kind of personal biography, one of the things that we've tried to do with unsettling events is to, to connect the structural level with the personal level. So the macro and the micro. Because what we didn't want to say is that any sort of personal experience can be an unsettling event. So bereavement, divorce, unemployment, then everything becomes an unsettling event. It, the, the term becomes too elastic. Mm -hmm. So what we've tried to do is to look at the interconnections between an unsettling event at the structural level, like a recession, with how that then impacts on personal biographies. So it's, again, very elder Glenn Elder influenced in terms of connecting the structural, the macro and the micro. So that's kind of where we're thinking about that. 
Thanks a lot. The answer was way more elegant than the way how I tried to rephrase. You're it. doing a fantastic <laughs> job. I mean, I, I've, I was thinking that as you were speaking, I've seen so many people try to do this to take questions out of the chat, and you're doing it brilliantly. Thank you. The last question is going to come out of my own mouth, and maybe uh, it's going to be uh, stretching the concept a bit uh, even further, but. Um, your last answer got me thinking about unsettling events in the context of the host society. Um, and um, you being familiar with the UK context, could there be an argument made that allowing uh, uh, this early access to the labour market for the new member states in 2004 in the UK, could this have acted as an unsettling event in the UK society or have these kind of tensions been rising later and, and maybe connected to different, different types of uh, factors or reasons? Yeah, that's a really good question. And in fact, um, in a paper that I mentioned earlier um, by Verdi and McGeever, uh, I think from 2018, they actually talk about that. They they say that if we're looking at the roots for the Brexit referendum, we do need to go back to accession. We do need to go back to 2004. And at the time, that was the Labour government were in power in 2004. And that was pre-recession. The economy was booming and there was a need. There were gaps in the labour market. And so the three countries in 2004 that gave immediate access to the labour market were Ireland, the Celtic Tiger, Britain and, of course, Sweden. So three countries gave immediate access in 2004 following accession. All the other countries had those um, limits uh, in place, temporary limits in place. So you could argue now, of course, with the benefit of hindsight, that perhaps that was a mistake. But at the time, the, the employment was there. The jobs were there. It was oh, it only really became a problem in 2008 with the recession when there was rising unemployment and then the EU migrants became a very easy scapegoat, particularly the Polish migrants, because everybody knew that statistic. There are a million Polish migrants in Britain. Um, it was just a very, very easy scapegoat. So I think that with the benefit of hindsight, you could say, actually, they should have reduced the numbers in 2004. But, you know, they were they needed them. So at the time, it seemed to make sense. Uh, economically, it made sense. But, yeah, I can see the logic of that. And I and I have heard that argument made. But I think it's it's more complicated than that. So if, if the recession, no, but if the recession had never happened in 2008, then maybe we wouldn't even be having that conversation now. Precisely. So there might also be a bundling of unsettling events that you need, a perfect storm for, for this to occur. I think that's an excellent point. And we're seeing that now with Brexit and the pandemic. We're seeing two massive unsettling events colliding. Um, and that's why I think people in Britain are, well, many people in Britain, not everybody, but many people in Britain are very worried about the economic fallout of, because we won't yet see the economic fallout of Brexit, but we're seeing the economic fallout of the pandemic restrictions. So, yes, it's again a bundling of two huge unsettling events. Louise Ryan, thank you so much for this talk and also for a really vibrant Q&A session. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, so those who are have joined us in the hopping environment, you can um, take a break for half an hour and then join us for the sessions. Um, and for those who are watching our stream on YouTube, we welcome you back at 4 p.m. Estonian time. This is one uh, really weird thing about online conferencing that um, everybody is still back at home. Had you traveled to Tallinn, <laughs> you would be forced <laughs> to look at Estonian time. So please do make the calculations not to miss other really enticing events. Russell, closing remarks. Uh, well, I wasn't expected to uh, to make any. But, I mean, I would like to add my add my thanks to uh, to to Louise Ryan for a, a truly um, inspiring uh, keynote lecture. I mean, really beautifully presented, uh, and you know we could hear every single word. Um, so that was also another aspect of the, the lecture which I, I'd like to refer to how 
um, you know, in, in terms of its kind of perfection, it was it was really easy to follow and, and easy to understand. So thank you so much, Louise, and thank you also to Marie-Louise for stepping in and managing the uh, uh, the discussion. Uh, you did a brilliant job on that. And now we take, um, I think, a half hour break and reconvene um, at, uh, well, 10 o'clock my time, 12 o'clock Estonian time, 11 o'clock other people's time. Uh, and uh, Farid and I will be sharing the, the, the chairing of the next session, which appropriately enough, of course, is on is on COVID uh, and its impact on migration trends. OK, so enjoy your coffee break and see you soon. Thank, Thank you. you all see very you. much. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.